All right, perfect. So yeah, so again, my name is Brent Colby here at the Fusion Conference. We're talking about leading volunteers, and there it is up behind us. What do you think of when you think of leading volunteers? What's the first thing that pops into your head? Go ahead and shout it out. What is it? Organized chaos. Yeah, organized chaos. Relationships. Yeah. Would you say something, Stephen? Recruiting. Recruiting. Yes. Oh. Who, for me, this was, I feel like I went into ministry because I was, like, I like people. You know, not that everyone's not that way, but I love people. I genuinely love being with people. And I think part of what one of the gifts I have for ministry is that I do enjoy being with people and I always thought recruitment for volunteers would be something fairly easy because of course I always served in ministry so then why wouldn't everyone else serve in ministry right have you ever thought that like well I would do this why wouldn't anyone else do this and I found that recruiting volunteers became like the bane of my children's ministry existence I, you've probably done this before I remember I was a new children's pastor I was getting really excited for what we were doing, and I decided that we would have a big volunteer recruitment drive. So I talked the pastor into it. It was this four-week-long thing. It straddled August and September, so you're getting all the people coming back to church that disappeared over the summer. You know those people. And so I thought, we're just going to make it as little as possible. So we put huge maps for the school year up, and we showed every volunteer position that that classroom, that that environment was going to need through the next nine months, and we had names written down, and there was blanks, right? And it was, are you going to fill in the blank, or whatever our campaign slogan was, are you, will you fill in the blank? And I remember at this church, this is out um, in, the, in the peninsula in a, in a little city called Polsbo. We printed these huge maps, we put them up on the wall, so as you were dropping off your kids, you could not help but notice huge blanks in our roster, right? Like, the guilt trip was going to work, I knew it. And then in the lobby... We had, we had our three, we had early childhood, we had elementary, and then we had our midweek programs. They had booths. And on the booths, they had big, dry erase boards with the amount of volunteers we had. There's a big number. And the amount of volunteers we needed. And the idea was every time somebody signed up, we would erase the numbers and we'd change them. So you had to leave church. You couldn't help but see these big, dry erase boards with big numbers written on them. People staffed behind them, smiling, wearing our brand new kids' ministry t-shirts. As you're dropping your kids off as a parent, you see, I thought this was going to be a home run. I had covered all the bases. And at the end of that recruitment campaign, it was four weeks long. Four weeks. That's a long time to nag people about volunteering, right? After four weeks weeks, we had signed up maybe a dozen people when we had needed like a hundred. And I felt like the biggest failure. And I thought something that I should be good at because I like people and I understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I felt really bad at it. And it was hard. To, like I had a bit of a crisis. Like, am I in the right job? Am I doing the right thing? Why is it so hard? And then we tried everything. And I'm sure you've tried it too. Do we have them volunteer for every other week? Do we have them come in once a month? Do we require volunteering? We talked about that. That's a fun conversation about early childhood. Do we require parents to come in? We presented to the seniors group. We presented to the parents group. We presented to the college group. We got involved in the student ministries. We did everything we could do to get people to volunteer. And I felt like I was pulling teeth to get people to do this. And why should it be so difficult to get people to volunteer? And what you clearly see, and I'm sure can clearly articulate as one of the most important ministries that your church ever does. Um, so I found myself asking these three questions. In fact, we can look at them up behind me. Here's the three questions. Where do, where do they come from? These are my primary questions for volunteers. Where do they come from? How can I keep them? And what do they do? And I think the answer to these three questions will help you lead volunteers. Um, yeah, can we push that next... Oh, got it. Oh, sorry. Should I grab a mic? Will that help you? Okay, I'll grab a mic. So, we'll grab this. It'll be official. So, the three questions on that next slide are, where do they come from? How can I keep them? And what do they do? I think if you answer this, you can start, for me at least, this helped me form ideas around leading volunteers that have led to be a, like a very effective season of leading volunteers. Um, so I'm curious, what, you guys, you, you do this every week, like you know that you, this is your world. Um, what are some of the more effective things, like what are some of the keys that you found when in your leadership of volunteers that have been really effective? What's for you, like what's, what's really worked? Yeah. Hey, I would have coffee with 
you, I want to talk to you, and then I personally go with them. Like, it doesn't seem to help to put out sign of change or put something in the bulletin. Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. It just doesn't seem to help, but if I take them to coffee, I think maybe they feel obligated. Yeah, so one idea. Personal connection, opposed to an impersonal announcement or bulletin, and even that relational going out to coffee or something is good. Are you going to say something? I just, you hear their heart. Yeah. Because like for us, we don't want just a warm body in a classroom. We want them to have a heart for children. Yeah. We don't want them to just, yeah, here's the lesson. Blah, blah, blah. We want them to be excited about it just as much as we are. Mm-hmm. And if not, sometimes more. Yeah. That personal connection opens the doors to not just have you hear them hear your heart, but you hear their heart and discovering that they can even be more passionate about serving than even you are for a specific, very niche thing. You ever had someone just fired up about their really specific area? We had volunteers. They loved, uh, we did the Royal Ranger and Girls Ministry program in one of the churches that we served at. And there were people who were passionate about the Rainbows program. Rainbows is like the pre-K, I think they do first grade, depending on the church you're at. It was this program that was kind of just tagged on to the front of the children's ministry thing. It always felt like an afterthought. It was like... Nursery 2.0. And of course, it's not that, right? But people would treat it like that sometimes. But we had leaders who were passionate about the Rainbows class. And of all the programs we led, and it was only the, only the children of the volunteers. We didn't open like a, a kindergarten, pre-K to everybody. It was the children of the volunteers. And it was like one of our best run, most exciting, most creative ministries that we had going on midweek. Because the person running it was passionate about it in a way that I frankly was not. I mean, they saw stuff and potential had dreams that it was awesome. Yeah. What's another one thing you've done that just been a big hit connecting? Um, I like side-by-side ministry. It's really worked. So like um, going beside someone like for a, a period of time and then like they can teach with you before then you just let them by themselves. And I think that that helps them to know where you're going, but then, then they can see how to do it. It's yeah. not so, oh, I can't, no, I don't, I'm not a teacher. I can't do that. But then if you show them you know, it does take, I feel like it takes a little bit longer then to like train up your leaders, but then once you've done that and you've invested that time, you have a new friend, they have a connection with you, and then they know how to, then they know how to do it. Yeah, side by side ministry, doing it with them before you just release them. So that's great. Okay, here's, we probably talk, and I would love to pick your brain, and we'll end with enough time to kind of talk about some of these ideas. Here's what I have found that works for me, okay? I just call this leading volunteers. Here's my three steps um, recruit, motivate, train. Recruit, motivate, train. This is what we're going to talk about. This is what I believe, has, at least for me, has been my key to success in leading volunteers. And I use the phrase leading volunteers very intentionally, right? Because it's not about recruiting volunteers. It's not about training. It's, it's all three of these components. When you can make them fit together, I believe that's the best way to answer those questions. You know, where do they come from, right? That's the recruitment phase. How do I keep them? That's the motivation phase. And then what do they do? That's the training phase. And I like to frame these three under answering kind of these these three even bigger questions. Um, Why, how, and what? All right, so the first one is recruiting volunteers. And here's the key. You recruit volunteers with your mission. Mission is what recruits volunteers. And your mission is why your ministry exists. Okay? Often, and this is what I did. I had that big chart and I showed all the needs, right? I was recruiting for what? Right? What do we need? We need a check-in person. We need a nursery worker. We need a this person. We need a security guy. We need a this. We need a that. What, 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 what? And we stand up and we assume people know why. But then the, the bait, the carrot that we put out in front of them to draw them in is a task, a job, a responsibility. And it took me a long time to realize people are not motivated by a task. They're motivated by a mission. Yeah. And so often, I think our recruitment falls short because when we try to recruit people to join us in training these kids, we recruit with what instead of why. And I believe the why is the mission or the purpose of your ministry. People will serve at your trunk or treat event. They will serve at your, I mean, fill in the blank, right? Your midweek program, your Sunday program. Not because they're really pumped up about doing check-in. They may, but that's not why they come. They come because of the overarching purpose, reason, meaning behind the event. They don't get excited about the details. You know, they get excited about the abstract 
big picture vision, just dream that you have for that event. Um, this is why your ministry exists. People attracted to the abstract because of your ministry. So here's, here's a question you have to ask yourself. Do you know why your ministry exists? Can you articulate that really clearly? And this whole thing works at a high level, right? Why does our church exist? Why do we do children's ministries? I mean, you get even deeper. Why do we do midweek programs? Why do we do uh, boys and girls groups? Or why do we do a missions thing midweek? Or why do we do a kids' worship? I mean, you should be able to articulate the why behind every part of what you're doing. Because if you just skip that and go straight to the what, to the details... You're really setting yourself up for failure because you're not drawing people in into the mission of God is what really drives people. And if they can see how this is, it helps fulfill the overarching mission of your church, you got them. I mean, you got them. People want, you know this, people deep down, they want to serve. They want to get involved. Just look at our culture. We live in a very strange time today 2016, when we're recording this, we live in a time where volunteering is cool. Everybody has a cause today. Have you noticed this? Everybody has a cause. Look up any celebrity, any professional athlete. We live in a cause-driven culture. And it's unique because it's never been like this before. And it's also uniquely an American thing as well. It, of course, many places around the world share the same values. But it's a unique thing to our culture that everybody wants to support and get behind some sort of cause. And often, I found myself frustrated. I'm like, why don't they get behind this cause? This is a good cause. Why don't they want to wear our t-shirts and our hats and do our hashtags, right? Like, why aren't they behind our cause? And it's because I haven't recruited them for the cause. It's because I've recruited them for a job. And the job is not the cause, right? Check-in is not children's ministry. Check-in, teaching a class, it's part of it. But people don't wrap their head around it in that way. So that's the first thing. That's the first big idea. It's you recruit volunteers with mission. And this is why your ministry exists. Okay, number two, motivate volunteers. And this is, this is where... Um, what I'm sharing is a little bit different than maybe how you've thought about it before. And this is the point I struggle with the most because it is frankly the most difficult. You motivate volunteers through culture. Typically, when we think motivating volunteers, what do we think? We think the volunteer appreciation night. We think the taking them out to coffee. We think the, um, and what else do we do to thank our, what do you guys do to thank your volunteers? There's lots of stuff we do. That's great. Thank you cards. Starbucks gift cards. Yeah, we thank them, right? We verbally thank them. We have them stand up. We applaud them. We're doing these things here in our conference, right? It's part of our culture. We do these things. But when it falls short is when our, the motivation elements just become another event, another point on a map. And it's not part of who we are. See, a one-time volunteer appreciation dinner each year is excellent. But if that's just an event and not part of your church's identity, you're not getting it. And I have found this to be something that's really hard to do. You see, our culture is made up of two main things. It's, culture is a word that gets through. It's our buzzword of, of, of the years, right? This is what we talk about. We used to talk about worldview. Do you remember people? Everyone talk about your worldview, biblical worldview, Christian worldview. Now our language, we talk about culture, right? Engaging with the culture, creating a culture. where people of, you know, culture is our word today. Culture... Well, you can describe it to encompass everything. I really think it, it encompasses two main things. It encompasses your, your values, the things that are most important to you, and that's on the abstract side of things, right? But your culture is also very practical. It's the stuff you do. And on the other end, it's your systems, right? It's the practical things that you do. And you reinforce culture by connecting the dots between what your values are and what your systems are. So, for example, if you value... Um, showing appreciation to your volunteers, you have systems in place to do that, right? If you value biblical literacy in your children's ministries, you have systems in place to teach kids the Bible. If you value world evangelism, missions, you have systems in place to do that, right? And it's where you get to connect your mission, your very abstract value-based thing, with your 
vision, your very what you're actually doing, your very practical, concrete things. Your culture connects those two. And I believe most churches get frustrated like, oh, we have a clear vision statement. We have a clear mission statement. We know why we're here and we know what we're supposed to do. Why isn't it happening? It's because they've not connected the dots between their values and their systems. And I believe in an organization like the church, connecting those dots, that's what creates our culture. And you can say that is how we do ministry. So why, how, what? Mission, culture, vision. In our context here with volunteers, we're talking about recruiting with why, motivating with how, our culture, and training with what, our vision, what we are actually doing. We often add motivation as like a tagline to the end, right? We're going to recruit them, and we're going to train them, and then once a year we're going to thank them, right? And that's... Probably, you know, we think, oh, I wish we had an end of the year thinking thing. Like, you know, it, it would be great if we, you know, I've been talking to pastor about that for a year or whatever it is, wherever your church is at. Or we do that, but it's not great. Or we do it a couple times a year or whatever. People are motivated because of a healthy culture in your ministry. That could be with or without a big banquet, right? Part of your value of valuing these volunteers, you have to have systems in place to reinforce that, not at a one time a year, but constantly. It's the little thank you cards. It's the, it's the coffee trips. It's the, um, you know, it's the grace when they can't show up, right? All these things create a culture around your ministry that make people want to be a part of your ministry. It's both abstract and concrete. And, I put it here in the middle like this around how we do ministry because, again, often we lean really heavily on the one-time things or the once-a-year things, and that's not enough. Honestly, some of our children's ministries are oppressive to the volunteers in our church. And I hate to say that, but it's true. You've, maybe you've been a part where your, um, your great volunteer support ministry network has turned into like a bit of a tyrannical empire, right? People making phone calls on Saturday. Saturday. Have you ever hated, I hate the Saturday night phone call. Do you know that one? Oh, our kids are sick. And you're like, yeah, right. You know, like, oh, uh, my husband's out of town. I'm like, oh, you didn't know he was going to be out of town a month ago when I asked you to serve? Or like, oh, we have our friend's boat is like, I don't want to hear it. Just, hey, I got it. Fine. We'll find it. I'll do it. You know, I hated that Saturday night phone call. And we can get really possessive and we can start, instead of leading our volunteers into ministry with kids, we can start adopting a mindset where we're just managing everybody, right? We're not looking at the vast generosity and resources our church have to offer in creative ways we can lead people into ministry. But instead we feel like we got 10, uh, 10 pieces on the board, 10 pieces on the checker, and we have to manage it. We have to control where everything goes, how it works. We have to tell, no, don't go, don't go there, don't do this. You have to stick to it this way. And we become children's, mini, children's ministry managers instead of children's ministry leaders. Well, a management culture is about the least attractive thing you can do in your church. And a lot of us, just because it lends itself to that, we view it like that, we create a very unattractive and unappealing and like scary place to volunteer. You know, don't volunteer with the kids. You'll, once you put your foot in that door, you'll never get out, right? You, how, must, how many of us have the testimony? Well, I volunteered for one weekend and 15 years later, here I am, right? They said they needed someone to cover it for a month between children's pastors, and now he, I'm the kids' pastor. That was in 1986, right? Like, you've heard that, and some of you are that person. And some of us, maybe that was our introduction into children's ministries. That was mine. When I was a, a high schooler in our church, my dad was a pastor's kid. My, my dad was a pastor's kid. I'm a pastor's kid. My dad was the pastor. I remember my first time uh, volunteering in children's ministries was the Saturday night phone call, right? Okay, hey son, would you would you consider teaching the third grade class this Sunday? I'm pro- I was probably 12, right? So I'm like barely older than these. I'm like, uh, sure. And they gave me a box, and I won't forget it. I open the box and I look at the curriculum, and there is a thousand pieces. It was one of these curriculums that's like the more little itty bitty things the better. It's like people love tubs and containers and labels, write curriculum that's just designed specifically for this. And I looked at it, and I'm a, a young man who has no organizational skills whatsoever. We had lots of fun. I don't know what we taught that Sunday, but it was not the lesson, right? The Bible was in there somewhere, I'm sure. But that was my introduction to kids' ministries. And I remember teaching, you know, for years in our church, just helping out in a variety of ways. But when we act without 
thinking about it consciously, we create a culture, a management culture around our ministry and not a leadership culture about our ministry. It becomes us pushing people into positions and twisting their arm and finding ways to manipulate them to serve, opposed to us saying, hey, come follow me. This is what we're doing. And it's so attractional and irresistible. People want to be a part of it. So does that make sense at all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So your motivation is not an event. It's not a one-time thing. It has to be part of your culture. Um, I think on that uh, bigger slide, that's how our ministry works. It's a combination of values and systems. Okay, here's the last one. Um, training volunteers. What do you guys do to train your volunteers in your church? How do you, what systems do you have in place to do training right now? What, yeah, what do you guys do? Yeah, so we do uh, basically a meeting every six weeks. Uh, one is, so we have three campuses. So one is uh, just our own location. Uh, and then six weeks later, we do a quarterly meeting, which we bring all campuses together and do a big training. We'll do like a safety training and things that everyone needs to know. Uh, CPR training is available and that kind of stuff. And then uh, six weeks later, you'll go back and have your locational meeting with your people. And then and ne- then the next six weeks is the next quarter. So you do training at six-week intervals. The first six weeks is a local and then the next six weeks is more like a regional with your larger group, so that in the alternate back and forth. That's great. Yeah, that's good. You had your hand up. What do you guys do? We do like a small training, like a trial period to see if they want to be in ministry. And then after they commit, we do different trainings, like going through safety, you know, two people rule, class of kids, how to react to certain situations in the safety process through all that. That's great. So we have like a trial phase with the introduction training and after that if they're into it you do a more in-depth training that's good i like that that's a good let people try it out first and see if it fits <laughs> what do you guys do uh, nothing uh, <laughs> nothing that's good too just throw them in there and see if they that's a great way to see if they're cut out for children's ministries by the way just throw them in there with some balloons and a piece of candy and a bible <laughs> who's been doing it for a while. So you have like a mentorship model, so they learn alongside. Because so many people don't have time to show up for meetings, yeah. and when we create more meetings, they just we're, we burn them out before they have a chance to start. And so we have really, honestly, kind of exiled the meetings business and just put them alongside someone who's been serving for a season and can kind of train them and then give them opportunity to say, "Yeah, this is my." This is where I love to be, you know. So maybe that means that they're shadowing someone in preschool, and then they're shadowing someone in kids, and then they're shadowing someone in different environments, so that then they can just see where their passion might lie. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really good. So that was a kind of a mentorship, apprenticeship model where you throw them alongside somebody and let them learn in real time. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> no, that's great. I love it. And nobody has time for that anymore. So I've almost had to adopt that same kind of a mentality. I was like, you plan a meeting, nobody shows up, you put all this work and time, and you buy cookies, and you do the whatever, and they say they're going to come, and then they don't, you know. And so it can really, that kind of a, in this day and age, can make you feel like such a failure with your leader. It really can give you this sense of, man, I suck at this job. I, I can do I can do, it's kind of like even what Rebecca talked about today. You know what? I can do this all myself. I don't even need these people. I'm just going to stick them into places where they don't have to be trained. You are the door monitor, like you go potty. You know, I mean, you're like, and you take it over all yourself, and it's so easy to get into that mentality. And when you do, it drains you so fast. Yeah. You know, and so I don't know. Like, is there is there a way to, does anybody have some incredible way that helps you get people to where they need to be? give them the training. I mean, I've even thought about like doing a training podcast or something like that so my leaders can watch it at home and feel like they've connected as a team without having to be in another thing. Yeah. So the tension we're talking about is it's hard, almost impossible to get people come in to church another time for another meeting. What do you do to do the training that is that they could do on their own time? Maybe um, we'll go here and then I saw you had something a thought too. What do you guys? Yeah. What do you guys do? So doing this, you know, I, I started doing it because I had a baby and other people were so unplanned. <laughs> just, you know, just like 
I'm going to give you the microphone real quick. That way we can all hear a little easier. So when I first started doing this, um, they, the way they got me in here was um, I just had a baby, and it was 10 years between my, my last child and my, my newborn, and I didn't want to leave her. So they said, well, you know, just stay. <laughs> That's how they do it. <laughs> you know, I watched, I watched how the person previous to me did it, and... Um, and I learned some things, and I didn't know at the time that uh, she was already had it in her mind that she was training me <laughs> to be her replacement. So within six months, um, that's exactly what I became, her replacement. And, you know, I, I noticed right away in the ministry there was, um, there was a tiredness, you know, amongst the volunteers, you know. And so I adopted this, I don't know, I don't know what you really call it, but just this philosophy that um, I would never ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And so it was just, you know, by example. Um, when I'm on a shift in the nursery, I'm just a nursery coordinator. I'm not, you know, like the head of the ministry or anything like that. Um, I always change all the nappies. I never, I never <laughs> my volunteers to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if we're recruiting for like a big event and we need um, you know, extra volunteers and things like that, I'm not in the event. I am in the nursery with my volunteers. And that's how, you know, and, and there were, I've had, like this last year has been a very rough year for me. We lost our oldest son. <laughs> my husband had a triple bypass. And my 21 year old just, just, you know, developed blood clots on the back of his brain. And throughout that, I was just so amazingly blessed by, um, you know, all the volunteers in the nursery that just, without even asking, just stepped in. It was just amazing. I mean, you know, I did give a thought to the fact that, oh, hey, maybe somebody's not going to show up, <laughs> you know, when, when I didn't come, you know, when I was really struggling, um, you know, right after my son died. But you know what? There was never a time when it wasn't covered. And, um, I, you know, and I don't know what engenders that kind of loyalty. I mean, but, um, you know, that's what I've always done in my ministry, you know, and, and that's just, you know, lead by example. I'm not this amazing person. I do have ten children, nine grandchildren, so I'm definitely a kid person. But I would never ask my volunteers to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do myself and have done <laughs> to do so. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really good. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Sounds crazy. You guys have been had a lot going on. It sounds like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? God's grace, though. Oh my goodness, and the strength. Yeah. Like I. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes, yeah. That's that's like that's excellent though. That's like leadership one one. Don't ask people to do something you're not willing to do. And what better way to show them that you're willing to do it than by doing it, right? Like that's legit. You know that's. Again, that's the difference between somebody managing, pushing people out, assigning tasks, and somebody leading. Come follow me. Come, let's go do this. Let's charge the hill together. Let's go. You know, so that's good. What's another um, another training thing? I have a more of a question. Like, I think we we're doing good with like coaching, right? Like, kind of coaching week to week, coaching through email communication, Facebook, and just kind of like coaching our people, but we're, we're doing a terrible job of training. Um, so I guess, you know, like where's that balance? Because I, personally, I feel like I can go to a training meeting and just retain very little of it. I probably was just a slow learner. But, um, but I feel like the coaching where I feel like I'm constantly being pushed, and I have a youth industry background where we never did training. Yeah. We just had people come and make sure um, they have a beverage head. So it was like, it's worth that line between <laughs> coaching and, and training and like what, you know, where, like, where are you putting eggs in which basket? Yeah. That's good. I know for a lot of our network stuff, you know, the Northwest Ministry Network, our ministries, our camps, this event, it's like 
the ministry in your church, but it's not the same. So I'm not, I realize it's not apples to apples, but there's a lot of similarities. One thing we do, and it's just like a, a lot of you have touched on this, we have, everybody is supposed to have somebody helping them who's going to take their job. So um, even at this event, I was Lindsay and Sean, Lindsay and Sean aren't here, Paul's not here. Paul's the director of our event. This is his third or fourth year doing it. And we have that discussion right up front. Okay, Paul, like two years ago, who's going to take your spot? This year, Sean and Lindsay are apprenticing, essentially. They're assistant directors under Paul. Next year, they're going to lead it, and Paul's going to assist them. We have the same thing for our camps. Our leadership positions are temporary. They get to serve here for three or four years, depending on the event, and at the two-year mark. Like, they still have two years to go. The question is, okay, who's going to replace you, and let's get that person plugged in now. And that is great for our teams. Plus, you understand what it does. It doubles that team, right? Instead of having one person in the spot, you have two. And you think, oh, well, yeah, that's wonderful. What if we just had double volunteers? That sounds great, doesn't it? That's like fictional land. But it's so much easier to recruit somebody as a helper for a class than to lead the class and to help them know. And it does. It it enables them to have that trial period where they get to just kind of come up. Sometimes the person we have apprenticing, the assistant, it's not a fit. It doesn't work out. And that's, I mean, that's why we have a two-year window to try to find a good fit. And then we just plug somebody else in there. Or they get a new job, or they move, or they, they train, they go somewhere else. But and a lot of you guys mentioned the idea of like doing online training, or having some elements, or some things written down. You know, everybody learns differently, right? Some people, it has to be written down, and they're like, give me the bullet points. I'm going to follow the points all the way. That's my wife. Right, Bree? What's the list? What's the checklist? Please alphabetize it or prioritize it. I'm going to start at the top, and I'm going to end at the bottom. Then I'm going to turn the page, and then I'm going to start at the top. Like, it's it's linear. Some people learn like that. Some people like me are very abstract. I'm like, what's the idea? Like, what does it feel like? And I take the manual and I throw it out the window dramatically and I'm like, who are we? As, you know, I'm like, I want to just create it. I want to remake things every time, which is a lot of work and not always necessary because very smart people who like lists have come before you and helped you out. I've learned this over the years. <laughs> so everyone learns a little bit differently. So trying to find, you know, different ways to do the training, it, you know, if there are some bullet points, one thing I'm a huge advocate of is the one-page job description, right? If you can hand somebody a one-page and it says, here's what the title is, here's what the commitment level is, here's the primary, here's the expectations, and those may, those may be same for all the jobs, your expectations, and then here's just the top ten, five or ten bullet points. This is what it's all about. And then the rest, a lot of it is just very hands-on. You just have to know. And you're not going to in a job description write where the... Windex is, right? Like that's that's a waste of your time because the Windex is going to move. You're not going to write, you know, well, the door latch is a little sticky. So people figure that stuff out when they're there. You need to give them like, here's the main things. If you hit these things, there's five of them. If you do this on a Sunday, you've, you've accomplished your job, right? The rest of the details, those are just details. And you know what? You're going to do them your own way anyways. But if you, if we list what's most important you know, these are things we can measure, these are things we can count, these are things we can say at the end of the day, you did it or you didn't do it. People know if they did a good job. And people want to do a good job. I think a lot of times we set our, our volunteers up to fail because we don't define what a win looks like for them, right? Think You've been in a position, right? You've served for years and months and you don't even know if you're doing it right. And then the only time you've talked to the pastor about it was when that one kid escaped, right? Or when... <laughs> When someone's tag wasn't there and you made them show you the ID because that's your policy and they got all upset, you know, they're, who cares if they're on the board, whatever it is, right? You've had those moments where the only time you hear from somebody is when you screwed up and you think to yourself, man, I've been serving here for like nine months and the only time someone has talked to me is when I messed up for the first time, right? We've, we've crushed it for nine months and this one weekend, the only time I get a phone call is because I screwed up. That's tragic. We've experienced that. It makes you feel horrible. And a lot of times we do that to our leaders. They can't feel like they've succeeded on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whenever, whatever you're doing because they don't even know what success looks like. They just know when they're supposed to show up, what they're supposed to do, and then when they're supposed to leave. And they say to themselves, oh, I hope we did it right, you know. That's why that re- recruitment and that motivation really connecting, here's our mission. This is what we're accomplishing. And, you know, we're here to support you and we believe in you and we value these things. And this is, these are all the systems and structures we have in place. You know, this is where your resources are. This is who you can call if you're sick. This is where you can go if you need some extra help. If you need someone to come in and give you, like if you, there's an emergency backup, you need, here's the number, here's the cell phone number to call, right? We have all this in place. 
that, that motivates people. You know, it makes their job really clear and helps them feel like they've like they're doing a good job. You know, so many people. That's all they want to do. They want to do a good job for you, but we haven't even we haven't given them the, the, the we haven't drawn the line in the sand that they know that they've crossed it. That they've done a good job for us, and it's it's relatively easy. You know, hey John, a win on Wednesday night with the boys looks like this. They've had fun. You've shared your heart with them. You've been honest. You've spoken some of God's truth into their life. And nobody's bleeding at the end, right? If you can do those four things, you know. Oh, bleeding could be fine, just as long as there's a band-aid on it. You've done those four things. You have won the night. Um, and it's important we try to recognize. That should be part of your system is checking in with those people and just, you know, hey, high five. You're, you're rocking it, whatever, whatever it is. Um, um, yeah. Here's the thing. We'll kind of flip to the second to last slide. Look at that little loop again. Recruit, motivate, train. Here's the question for you. This is abstract, right? This is a big picture. This is not details. I didn't want this, um, our time together to be really specific because each of you guys are going to apply these differently. But here's the work now you have to do. You have to look at these three things and you have to ask yourself, are we doing that? You know, how are we doing that and how could it improve? So are we recruiting with why? That's the first thing you have to write. I mean, literally answer this question this weekend. Are we recruiting with why? Yes or no? Or maybe? And then how are you doing that? And how can you, and if you're doing it well, you can do it better. And if you're not doing it all, you can start doing it. How do we recruit with why? Part of the back end of that question is, do we know why our ministry exists? Is that in alignment with why our church exists? You know, a lot of times, we'll talk a lot about, you don't get your own mission statement. Your pastor has given you a mission statement, right? We think of, oh, how am I going to brand this? How are we going to communicate this? We have a mission to do this in the schools and this in the community. And we have a, we're going to start a parenting. Your mission is your pastor's mission. And you have to get behind that. God has appointed him as leader of your church. You are there to support his mission for that church. If you don't like his mission for that church, you got to leave. That's it, right? You can help, but eventually you have to leave. You either need to get behind your pastor 100% or you need to get out because all it's going to do is cause both of you a lot of heartburn, all right? So first off, get behind your pastor. So now there's your mission, right? How does the children's ministry help accomplish that mission in your church? You can start articulating that. And then, are you using that to recruit people into your ministry? So that's where you lead. Second, motivating. What's, your, what's the culture of your ministry look like? What do you value? Could you write down a list? Here's our top five values. You should be able to do that. And it's an exercise that feels like a waste of time for a lot of us because it's so abstract. But here's the thing. Once you have, okay, these are our top five, top three, top ten. You pick. These are our values. On the other side of the paper, what systems do you have in place to reinforce those values? And I bet there's a value or two. A thing that you think is important, like theoretically, but it's practically not important because you have no system in place to reinforce that. Can you connect what's valuable in your ministry to the systems you've established in your ministry? And if you start thinking, how do we improve the culture of our, of our church, of our ministry? That's the work you do right there. And I believe that's 99% of churches that are struggling to get traction. This is why. Their values don't line up with their systems, which means they have an un ineffective and unhealthy culture. Having that integration is going to make your place a motivating and fun place to work because they can connect the stuff that they're doing on Sunday with the big mission that God call the reason why they're responding to being there in the first place. So that's, that's some work that you have to do with your team when you go back. The last one is training. That's when we get to what? That's the vision of what we're at. What does it look, vision, literally, what does it look like? A vision is a picture. It's a thing. It's a specific point on a map. You can look at vision and you can say, are we doing this? Yes, no. You can't look at mission and say, are we doing this? A mission's too abstract. It's too big. It's not empirical, right? You can't measure it. You can't grade it on an A to F scale. But vision is. Vision, you can look at something and you should be, able to quant should be able to count and say, did we accomplish our vision? Can you see it? And you should be able to say yes or no. Right? We, we have a vision that kids would come to know Christ, that kids would commit their life to Christ. Can you see kids committing their life to Christ? Well, we offered, a, we offered a, a chance for them to like whisper in their seat. Well, you got to measure it. Like You have to count that. That's, that's, that's what matters, right? you got to be able to count that. 
That's your vision. Can you see it? Well, and maybe it does look like a hand raised or a folded thing or whatever you do, right? You need to be able to count that. And that's what you recruit people to. Um, that's how you train. That's how you recruit. That's, how you, that's what you train them for. You're an altar call worker. Our vision is that kids would come to Christ. Here's the, three, here's the ABCs of salvation. Here's how you lead a kid to Christ. That's your training. We have a vision that we have a safe and friendly environment. What's that look like? It looks like a check-in. It looks like a system. It looks like a this, and it looks like a handshake. Here's your three steps of your training. That's your vision. You can visually see it. You can explain it extremely practically. And then you have to figure out, how are we going to train these people? They're not coming to meetings like they used to. Um, can we do something online? Can we upload a few introduction videos to YouTube? Is that effective? Do we partner them with someone for a season? Do we have a trial period? You know, there's... It's going to be different church systems are all going to work different. At Tacoma, you guys have a big church with multiple campuses. Your systems are going to look different than the church I was in in West Seattle where I got a box of like doodads and they're like, okay, Brent, you're leading. You know, like that's a, it's going to be a different system wherever you're at. And you have to find, no one can tell you what your system of training is going to be. You have to figure it out. But if you can do it in a context of this, I can guarantee it's going to be much more effective than if you're just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping things stick, right? I hope this appreciation night has the effect we want. I hope this training seminar does good. I hope our after school program makes sense. I hope this recruitment campaign with whiteboards is going to be effective. You know, any of those things can work, but you just have to you just have to frame it the right way. You have to help people connect the dots. Um, so, anyways, all right, um, we're going to end with that. Um, any last thoughts or questions? Our next workshop starts in seven, so I want to make sure we have time to get there. Last call for thoughts, questions, comments. Um, yes, Stephen. Just real quick, one thing that, that works for us for getting folks, in, and this might sound crass or whatever, is I look for misfits. Folks that, that have been rejected in other ministries. Yeah. And and we've, we've welcomed them into the children's ministry, and they're flourishing. A, a lot of folks that, that want to volunteer, that, there's a lot of folks out there that want to do something. And for one reason or another, they don't fit in a, another ministry in the church. I look for those folks. They've been some of my best, best volunteers, some of them with the biggest hearts. And, and I watch them interact with the kids, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that the kids seem to really listen to, even if they're just doing horribly up on the platform or something. The kids are just messing with them. Yeah. Children's Ministries is one of the best places to serve because it's a safe place to serve. I was when I because I was a youth pastor for five years before I did kids ministries and in youth ministries the students are asking themselves, do I like this guy? Do I like this guy? Do I like this guy? And it can take months, maybe even a year, for them to decide whether or not they like you. Kids, they're asking this question: Does this person like me? Does this guy like me? Does this guy like me? And in an instant, you can show a kid that you love them and they are yours. And well, maybe only a certain type of people can get students to like them, right? And I'm simplifying. It's not this simple. But anybody can come in and love on a kid and those kids are instantly, in a way only a child can. They they love that person. They're in with that person. We'll do one last thought and then we'll get out of here. Real quick, uh, I came from the East Coast, so I bring a little bit different perspective. And one thing that our church did back East was um, we would take a Sunday, a regular Sunday service to highlight a specific ministry. So, like, we would have a kids, a children's ministry day where the children's pastor would come in, the regular church service, the children's pastor would lead, they would do all of the children's stuff. And then we would have a, a girls ministries day, we would have a, a youth day, we have a Royal Rangers day, where we would just have one service that's dedicated to highlighting that ministry, and then like after the service, the leaders would be around for anybody to talk to, whether they want to get their kids involved in that ministry, or if they wanted to volunteer to help out with that ministry. Yeah, that's great. It's really helpful for that church. Yeah, that's the idea of having a ministry emphasis Sunday. I don't know if you guys have done those before, but those are a great way to even just literally show people, here's what we do. And people are like, oh my goodness, you do stuff with the kids. That's great. I thought they just disappeared for an hour and came back. So anyways, well, we'll pray and we'll let you guys head off to your next workshop. God, we thank you and we love you that you use us. We're humbled that you use us. 
And I pray we would be good stewards of our responsibilities at church. God, we oversee hundreds and hundreds of hours each year of people's time. The most precious resource they have in life is their time. And we have been entrusted to steward that time, to make it meaningful, not only of our leaders, but the kids they're doing ministry for and with. God, and I pray that you would help us lead these volunteers, that we would lead by example, that we wouldn't be managers moving pieces around on a board. God, that we'd be leaders, that we would have an inspirational team and inspirational setups and that we would um, just, just install the passion that you've put in us, that we would be able to put that passion out there for other people to be drawn to that and to serve these kids because of that. God, help us motivate them. Help us create healthy cultures that are balanced, that are transparent, and that are honest, and that are real. And help us train people real effectively, God. This is a challenge that a lot of us are going to have to answer in our own unique ways, in our own church context. Help us find effective solutions to training people and setting them up to have a big win when they do come and spend time with the kids. We pray you help us be creative in imagining these solutions in your your name. Amen. 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 Cool. Thank you guys.